It is my honor tonight to introduce an outstanding journalist who detected uh, early on the real dynamics of the Arab uprisings of 2011, both in the Middle East and in Washington and Western capitals. Mr. Coburn's most recent book is timely. Its title is The Jihadi's Return, ISIS and the New Sunni Uprisings. This is a very good moment to meet because this is a year in which, which something quite extraordinary happened in the Middle East. Uh, this is the development of the Islamic State uh, of ISIS, which uh, as now uh, is currently besieging uh, Kobani. Um, and this particular week, I think, is also a very important moment in the history of the Middle East, of Iraq and Syria, and of neighboring countries. Um, even the last couple of days in Kobani, which is a Syrian Kurdish town on the uh, um, Turkish border, um, the uh, ISIS has entered the uh, suburbs of Kobani. Uh, 160,000 people have fled. Um, the uh, Turkey has said that it will not help. Today, the US was bombing hard to try and stop ISIS. Uh, but there was, they may not succeed. Um, it's so important because it's, it's a critical uh, point in President Obama's plan to uh, what he called uh, degrade and destroy uh, ISIS. You'll remember that the US started bombing on the 8th of August in Iraq and uh, extended that to Syria on the 23rd of uh, September. At the time, there was great rhetoric about how ISIS was going to be uh, uh, eliminated. You will see all those exciting pictures on television of plumes of smoke rising and those videos of vehicles being uh, targeted and then being uh, destroyed. But uh, it hasn't happened that ISIS has not only not been degraded and destroyed, but it's still expanding. Uh, expanding at Kobani, uh, in other parts of Syria, towards Aleppo, and also, I'll talk about this later, in Iraq. One of the reasons that we have all uh, know about Kobani is that it's on the Turkish border, and journalists can see it from across the border. But there are battles and great acts of violence occurring throughout Iraq and Syria that nobody sees because journalists can't, like myself, can't go there because they chop our heads off. And because even local journalists, it's extraordinarily dangerous to do anything. Um, ISIS has produced a 11-point guide for local journalists, which basically says, if you do anything, we'll kill you. Um, so there's a paucity of information coming out. Um, the Islamic State, so-called, which was announced on the 29th of June, now extends from the borders of Iran, northeast of uh, Baghdad, right across northern Iraq, up the Euphrates into eastern Syria, to uh, the outskirts of Aleppo. I mean, this is an area I'd say about the same size as France. Uh, it really is very big, and it's not getting any smaller. Um, the uh, in Iraq, which is a country I've been going to since the 1970s, but still produces uh, many surprises. Uh, while everybody's attention has been on Kobani, actually the Islamic State has been moving into West Baghdad. Uh, they 
have been overrunning uh, Iraqi garrisons. Uh, they have uh, taken a lot of equipment, uh, and this is despite American airstrikes. It's, it's really not working. Um, so uh, the point I want to make is the Islamic State, uh, three, three and a half months after they took Mosul in uh, northern Iraq, is still uh, growing uh, and getting more powerful. And the attempt to hold them back through airstrikes alone isn't working. The, um, why is this happening? Well, one reason is uh, the type of enemy they face uh, in Iraq. The army remains extremely weak. The state extremely corrupt. Uh, I was talking to an Iraqi a politician earlier this week and said, you know, why is not the army, Iraqi army fighting back? And he told me a story that the inspector general for the Iraqi army uh, last weekend went to see their best, their only armored division, which is meant to have 120 Abram tanks uh, and uh, 10,000 uh, soldiers with it. He found, in fact, there were only 68 tanks and 2,000 soldiers, although uh, 10,000 were being paid for. Why does it happen? Because of quite a lot of this army are ghosts. They never existed as soldiers, but somebody is taking their salary. Uh, another thing that happens frequently is that you join the Iraqi army, you get paid, but you return half your salary to the officers and never go near the barracks. So uh, ISIS, the Islamic State, is not facing uh, very uh, powerful uh, opponents. Um, it's also very important what's happening in Kobani because it means it is splitting the Turks and the Kurds. For the Kurds, this is kind of their battle of Thermopylae. This is the moment that they're trying to hold their own against superior forces, and they think that the Turkish army has stabbed them in the back, that supplies are not being uh, allowed through, that uh, uh, basically uh, the Turkish government has decided that it's in its interests for the Islamic State to let them be destroyed. And so consequently, in the last 24 hours, there have been um, riots and demonstrations all over Turkey by Kurds in uh, the Kurdish southeast of the country and in other cities like Istanbul and Ankara, where there is a large uh, uh, Kurdish minority. 18 people have been killed. Uh, a well-known human rights uh, lawyer was shot in the head in uh, Istanbul. Um, the Kurdish uh, crowds uh, got very angry at one point, took a, a head of uh, the um, uh, Turkish leader Ataturk, a bust, and started kicking around in the streets, which is very dangerous in Turkey because of the strength of Turkish nationalism. Um, the, not all, I'm spelling this out, but not all this is reported uh, outside Turkey because the Turkish media is fairly heavily uh, uh, censored or restrained by government pressure. The, uh, there is, in fact, a CNN Turk, which uh, um, is famous during the riots a year ago in Gezi Park for while the riots were going on all over Istanbul they ran a documentary on penguins, uh, creating some hilarity. This time around, while these riots are all going on all over Turkey with smoke rising in from fires in every street, they ran a documentary on honeybees. Uh, so, uh, um, but these are very, these riots are very important. So, Kobani is, um, I think, a rather crucial moment in the history of this part of the Middle East. Um, there's a very sort of peculiar situation in 
uh, the opposition to the Islamic State. Uh, Obama created this alliance of countries, uh, 44 in all, who are pledged to oppose the Islamic State. But actually, not many of them are actually doing it. And some of those, like Turkey, have made clear that if they have, they say that their own uh, Kurdish guerrilla organization, the PKK, is just as bad as the Islamic State. And going by their actions, they would prefer uh, the Islamic State to their own Kurdish separatists. Um, the um, uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, uh, Bahrain are also been participating in attacks on the um, uh, on ISIS on the Islamic State, but these are the very states which uh, spent a great deal of money and supplied a great many weapons to set up the jihadi movement in Syria in the beginning, and also in Iraq. Uh, so they're not really committed to acting uh, against ISIS. Um, but the, and this is what's so strange about this American-led alliance, is that those who are actually fighting ISIS on the ground, like the Syrian Kurds, or the Syrian army, or Hezbollah of Lebanon, or the Iraqi Shia militias. I, I'm not saying this to say these are great guys, but they are the ones who've been doing the fighting. But these are held at arm's length and aren't being uh, assisted in uh, help in, um, in trying to hold ISIS back. So in fact, it seems to me this is a recipe for uh, failure. Uh, and ISIS has been very acute, very acute in um, being able to exploit the divisions of its enemies. Uh, what's the bottom line on this? That ISIS isn't going away. That if you listen to political leaders in the last few months in America and every country in Europe, uh, the television screens were filled with people uh, saying that uh, they were going to eliminate ISIS, and it simply hasn't happened. It's actually grown stronger and has grown bigger. Um, where did this organization come from? Because it is very peculiar. I mean, how many other organizations have declared their own state uh, in recent years? have not only declared it, but have done something about it. Uh, it comes out of war. It comes out of the war in Iraq after 2003. And ISIS is very much the child of war. It's really a, it, it combines religious fanaticism and military expertise. But its leadership and its core members have all been fighting in wars against the Americans, against the Iraqi government since the fall of Saddam Hussein uh, in 2003, then again in Syria after 2011. Um, probably there were some officers from Saddam's own arm, old army that pr uh, provided military knowledge. But my own suspicion as to why they're so effective is that they've simply been fighting for a long time. And if you've been fighting pretty proficient armies like that of the Americans and you've survived after 10 years, you're pretty, probably pretty good at your job. Um, the, uh, where does its fanaticism come from? And this is very important and I think not perhaps explained enough. Um, the actual ideology of the Islamic State of ISIS is not that much different from the variant of Islam, Wahhabism, 
which uh, is prevalent in Saudi Arabia. It's um, Wahhabism is very sectarian. It regards Shia Muslims uh, as not Muslims. Uh, it regards Christians and uh, heretics, uh, Christians and Jews, uh, as completely beyond the pale. Um, it is, uh, regards women as somewhere be being between second-class citizens and chattels. Uh, it uh, uh, has, uh, is violent in its punishments and its implementation of Sharia law. I mean, the only other place that uh, beheads people continually outside the Islamic State is Saudi Arabia. It's also the only country in the world where women aren't allowed to drive. Um, and uh, in many respects, what the Islamic State believes uh, is only Saudi Wahhabism carried to, a, to its logical and most violent conclusion. Um, the um, uh, Wahhabism, I think one of the sort of trends over the last uh, 40 years, uh, which has been perhaps not noticed enough in Europe and elsewhere, is the way that Saudi Wahhabism has sort of taken over mainstream Sunni Islam. There are 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. 90% of them are Sunni. And this, um, uh, uh, and Wahhabism has come to be the dominant ideology. And this is where religious minorities are all threatened. Uh, Christians, Shia, Sufi, Yazidis, uh, Jews, anybody else, you name it. This has been the great big change. I mean, when I first, I first went to Baghdad in 1977, one of the reasons I liked it was just the diversity of people there. You had lots of different types of Christians, Christians who'd been there for the last 1,600 years. You had uh, strange groups like the Yazidis who had elements of Zoroastrianism, of old Persian religion, uh, in their beliefs. Um, likewise, you go to Damascus, uh, you find churches that have been there since the begin almost since the beginning of the Christian era. And now all this is ending. I mean, it's ending as we speak. The Christians are fleeing, the Yazidis have fled. Some of the other minorities have gone. And it's difficult to see how this is reversed. Uh, why has this happened? We can talk about the Islamic State but one of the, it is Saudi, Saudi Wahhabism, which I think really changed things dramatically in uh, the region um, without much it being countered by uh, Western or outside uh, powers. Um, and this is, this is true certainly in the Muslim world. I mean, a friend of mine in London was saying to me the other day, that he thought that very few Sunni or Shia in London had the address of a member of the other variant of Islam in their address book. They simply don't talk to each other anymore. Uh, they're very ignorant, certainly the Sunni are very ignorant of the Shia. There used to be a time when Shia were regarded as a different type of Muslim. Now they're not regarded as Muslims at all. Um, and this spreads, you find, pretty well unnoticed, not much reported in the media, but increasing sort of sectarianism in places where there are small Shia minorities in uh, Malaysia and in Indonesia. Um, I didn't think there were many Shia in Egypt, but uh, a year or so ago, uh, 
in a village. Four of them were dragged out of their house uh, and uh, lynched in the streets. It was all uh, shown on, on, on YouTube. Uh, horrific events. Um, and this is spread Tunisia, all these other places where there are small minorities. And it's not just Shia, it's the Christians as well. The Christians have been, as you know, expelled from Mosul. There's a, there was quite a big uh, Christian minority in Mosul. This is the second biggest city in Iraq, in northern Iraq. Um, the, um, uh, there were Christian monasteries around Mosul, which had been there for a thousand years. Uh, there's a Christian, uh, ancient or Christian quarter in one part of Mosul um, where you sort of see the buildings that I, I mean, look so old. They look to me as though they went back to Roman times. They can't, but they, they're sort of early medieval. And all this is being uh, extinguished and uh, the church is destroyed. Um, so there's a sort of reign of terror uh, among all the minorities in the Middle East. Um, and it's at its worst in Iraq and uh, Syria, but actually it's sort of spreading everywhere else uh, as well. Um, the, why is there not more opposition to it? I think partly the sort of the wealth of Saudi Arabia, that this is what gave it a push. Uh, you know, if you have somebody in Bangladesh who wants to build their own mosque, they need $20,000. Saudi Arabia is about the only place they can get it from. Even in Syria before 2011, the Syrians had accepted, Syrian government had rather unwisely accepted an offer by the Saudis to pay for a lot of imams in the, in the local mosques. Um, so this wealth was deployed to change the nature of Islam in significant ways towards a more sectarian variant. And there really wasn't much opposition in America or Europe because uh, the Saudis had a lot of money. I would, last time I looked some time ago, America, I think, had $86.1 billion worth of arms contracts with Saudi Arabia. The British have big contracts, less in value. Uh, but uh, there was never, although certainly in Britain, in my country, politicians are always very happy to sort of denounce some local uh, Muslim imam for being sectarian or pro-jihadi and so forth. But you never see them summon the Saudi ambassador to the foreign office to say, uh, why are Saudi millionaires, billionaires, funding uh, uh, satellite television, which is used by uh, sectarian preachers of hate calling for the death of Shia, the death of Christians, uh, uh, for everybody to go on jihad. If you look up on, up on YouTube, you find millions of people have already watched this, extraordinary numbers. So very influential. Um, and one of the peculiar things about the last three years is that it's the most bigoted and sectarian people who became most adept at using the social media. In 2011, you may remember, that it was said, and I, I may have said it myself, that you know, the social media, uh, YouTube, uh, Facebook, uh, tweeting, etc., was progressive and positive because it avoided official censorship, that it would reduce the power of police states to control information. In fact, what's happened is rather different, that the people who became really astute in using it have been the Islamic State uh, to put out propaganda which is primeval in its nature but often very skillfully made. These awful uh, movies in which the Islamic State is shown uh, executing people, killing people, and so forth, are actually rather well-made movies. 
Um, and it's very effective. One of the reasons the Iraqi army ran away is they'd all seen these movies in which Iraqi soldiers are on their way to their bases and so forth have been dragged out of cars and shot in the head. And then they show the, uh, the man with his military ID. And then they show the body. Now you can imagine the effect on the families of soldiers, Iraqi soldiers in Baghdad when they see this stuff. And they all do. Um, and the same is true of the, of the Syrian army. Um, so they became very skilled at uh, using this. Um, and somehow, these are very visual cultures. They, when they see things, uh, they believe all this. It isn't necessarily true. A friend of mine in South, Southeast Turkey found some children in a refugee camp looking at a horrible uh, video on the internet of two uh, men having their heads chopped off with uh, chainsaws. But he recognized it actually wasn't from the Middle East at all. It was they originally uh, came from an, a, a Mexican drug war that some Mexican drug lord had executed or murdered some of his rivals in this way and put it on YouTube. But when it was shown to these children, when they were looking at it, underneath it said, these are Alawites, the ruling Shia caste in uh, Syria, uh, murdering Sunnis. So you can imagine the impact that this has had. Um, is this becoming uh, irreversible? I mean, I wish I could say it wasn't, but the situation does not look good. The Iraqi army and state are extremely weak. Um, the Americans uh, spent, I think, $26 billion training the Iraqi army, but it immediately ran away. Um, it's, why did this happen? Well, under Saddam, almost all the officers were Sunni, about 95% of them, so there weren't many Shia officers, but the present government is Shia, so they want Shia officers, so they're not very uh, well trained. Uh, another reason is, is simply corruption. I mean, I was talk after the fall of Mosul, I was talking to an Iraqi general, four-star Iraqi general who'd been recently retired, um, and I said, you know, why did the army run away? And he said, corruption, corruption, corruption. Uh, he said it began the Americans outsourced supplies to the Iraqi army. It seemed a rather good idea at the time. It was in keeping with their economic philosophy. Uh, but a very bad idea in the circumstances of Iraq. What would happen would be that you'd have food supplied. Uh, a, the officer of a battalion of 600 would get be paid to uh, feed his men. He would uh, take the money for feeding 600 men. But fortunately to him, there'd be only about 200 men in his battalion. And he would then pocket the difference and share it out among the other officers. So the Iraqi army, uh, and this applied to everything else, where you have checkpoints all over Iraq and Syria. If you're a foreigner, you sail through, you hope. Uh, but if you're a truck coming through, you have to pay. So these checkpoints all act really like customs posts and they're a big source of revenue. Uh, now, as a consequence of this, um, being an officer in the Iraqi army uh, became very profitable, and people paid for it. You want to be a colonel in the Iraqi army. Uh, it'll cost you about $200,000 to get that job, and you get it back through these various racketeering means. Uh, you want to be a divisional colonel, about two million. Um, but you ended up with an army which actually wasn't going to fight anybody. Um, and I mean, I'm, last year I was talking, I was in Baghdad, I was talking to a politician, um, and he said to me, the, the Iraqi army won't fight, it won't fight anybody. So I said, well, why not? Some of them, surely some of them will fight, you know. 
And he said, no, 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 you don't understand. He said, these guys have bought their jobs. He said, they're not soldiers, they're investors. They, they did it. They, they're not a colonel in order to perform any military activity, but in order to make money. Um, and I must say, I was sitting after the fall, but I was sitting in Baghdad, and people were telling me, you know, Baghdad cannot fall uh, uh, because it has a city of seven million. It has a majority of Shia, there were Shia militias, the Iraqi army. Um, and we were all telling each other the same thing. It can't fall for the following reasons. But I must say, thinking then and thinking now, uh, I'm not so sure it's true. Um, it's, so it's a very sort of peculiar state that the Americans fostered. Um, you know, people debate whether foreign intervention does good or bad. It seems to me on certain occasions you can justify foreign intervention in a place like Kobani uh, when the Islamic State is advancing and trying to murder people. Yes, it's quite a good thing that somebody with be it American planes try to tr bomb them and stop them. But the problem in Iraq, and I saw this over many years, was that if you have any outside power occupying another country, whatever its supposed motives, it basically looks after its own interests. I mean, that's what governments are meant to do. And at moments, its interests might, American interests might coincide with those of Iraq. But in the long term, they don't. So Iraq had an extraordinarily incompetent, corrupt prime minister recently dismissed called Nouri al-Maliki. Uh, but why was he prime minister of Iraq? Well, basically, the American ambassador had appointed him and the Iranians had said they'd go along with it. Um, and Iraqi government was sort of a creation of foreign powers, which robbed it of legitimacy, and also just robbed it of competent people. Because people who sort of disagreed with the Americans didn't get promoted. Um, what could be done now? Um, I think in the long term in dealing with ISIS, uh, as I said earlier, ISIS is the creation of war. It comes out of war. In some ways, you, I think there might be a parallel with European fascism in Italy and Germany in the 20s and 30s. It sort of came out of the First World War of extreme violence of people who were used to dealing with the world around them by violence. Um, and uh, very paranoid. Uh, ISIS is somewhat similar. Paranoid, sectarian. I mean, uh, a Shia friend of mine was saying uh, he's, to me the other day, he said, I genuinely feel, I think I must feel like Jews in Germany felt in 1934, not later, but a, a sense of continual threat. And there is a parallel uh, between what happened in Europe then and what's happened in Iraq now. How do you deal with this? It seems to me that one thing that should have been done, but hasn't been done, but might still be done, was to end the war in Syria. This is what detonated Iraq. I mean, why did Iraq erupt again after we had these wars from 2003, went on, reached its height 2007, then it ebbed. Uh, by 2010, things were, were not satisfactory. The, the Sunni were not happy, but they don't, didn't think there was much they could do about it. Um, violence was reduced. Um, uh, now, it's often blamed on Maliki, on persecution, and of the Sunni and so forth. I think it's wrong. I think that what really happened was very simple, that the, the Syrian war started. Uh, and the Syrian, Syria is 60% uh, Sunni Arab, and uh, Iraq is 20%. For ISIS and the jihadis, there was a much bigger opportunity there. And that destabilized Iraq. Uh, the, it, the Saudis and others, Gattari, started spending money funding Saudi organizations. And I remember at the time, uh, Hosha Zabari, the foreign minister of Iraq, 
saying to me, you know, if this war goes on in Syria, it will restart our civil war. It was not that the Iraqis didn't see it coming, but there wasn't much uh, they could do about it. Um, the war in Syria, um, I think there was a great miscalculation by outside powers in about 2011 and 12. They thought that Assad would go down the same way as Gaddafi. Uh, I thought it was never going to happen because at his weakest, Assad, there are 14 provincial capitals in Syria. He controlled 13 of them. Uh, also at the backing of Russia and Iran and Hezbollah, Gaddafi was isolated. But they were convinced of this. So the only negotiating platform which the US and the others would okay was one in which uh, of transition, in which Assad would go. But since Assad controlled most of the country, he wasn't going to go. So in fact, peace negotiations, so-called Geneva II, earlier this year, by insisting that he go, they in fact provided a recipe for continuing war. Now, this is important because this is the ground in which ISIS, the Islamic State, flourishes. Uh, they know how to deal with war. They don't know much anything else. They're rather like a sort of Islamic Khmer Rouge. I don't know how many people recall what happened in Cambodia in the 1970s. But you had a sort of ideological group, fanatical group, good at war, dealt with everybody by extreme violence, murdered a million of their own people, institutionalized torture. Uh, in some ways, they resemble uh, the Islamic State. Um, how do you defeat this group? Well, actually, I think the first thing you do is you try and reduce the war. In Syria, um, I don't think you can reach, people say, what's the solution? Actually, I don't think there is a solution, because people hate each other too much. But what you could do, if you had the support of, of uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia, America and Russia, is institute ceasefires, institute truces. You have to bring down the level of violence before you can even begin to negotiate between people. Otherwise, you have what in Northern Ireland we used to call the politics of the last atrocity. Everybody is dominated by the last atrocity. They can't talk to anybody. And I think that uh, that is just feasible if the great powers had a more uh, responsible attitude. Uh, otherwise, I think they can fight it out with ISIS. Um, but um, they're dealing with a group which martyrdom is at the center of their ideology. Um, you uh, get killed fighting. This is an expression of your faith. Uh, you go straight to paradise. Um, this, uh, this local Sunni population, there was this hope that they would eventually turn on the Islamic State uh, because of their uh, repression. Um, but I think that this is very naive. I mean, how do you turn on people who are incredibly violent, very well organized, and are expecting a stab on the back? You know, they're, they're going to kill you first. So I don't think that that's uh, going to happen. Um, I think that the, for most of the minorities in the Middle East, in Baghdad, and Syria, they sort of just want to get out now. Uh, that uh, they don't see that they have a future in these countries. And the only way that you could conserve those that remain is by uh, ending this war in Syria, which has, is eating away and destroying the whole region. Thank you very much. Thank you.